No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills, holding darkness within. Walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there, walked alone. If you're a big fan of horror fiction, then there's a good chance that this next book has had a profound impact on some of your favorite writers. Stephen King said that The Haunting of Hill House, along with The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, which is another book that I reviewed this month, um, between them, they are the two only great supernatural stories that have been written in the last 100 years. Neil Gaiman said that when it comes to stories that make him want to sleep with the light on, I'm paraphrasing by the way, uh, sleep with the light on or books that just made him shiver and he just couldn't get out of his head, it really came down to just a handful. And one of them was The Turn of the Screw, again. Another was Ghost Story by Peter Straub. From Stephen King, it was it, Salem's Lot, and The Shining, but he said none of them, none of them could compare to The Haunting of Hill House. So in this book, we are invited to spend a night in Hill House, probably the most famous haunted house in all of... Is it the most... Fa would I say that? Yeah, that's a big statement. Am I gonna, st am I gonna die on this hill? Yeah. So we meet Eleanor and she is a very fragile woman in her early 30s who is living a mundane and quite frankly very sad life. And so when she's given an opportunity to escape from this sort of dark reality by Dr. Montague uh, and, and stay at Hill House, uh, she just jumps at the chance. And then when she gets there, she meets the other characters who are uh, Theodora, also known as Theo, and Luke. Um, and all of them are there to, along with Dr. Montague, basically prove the existence of ghosts through scientific means. As the group all settle in, they are confronted with cold spots, unsettling noises in the house, uh, kind of unexplainable events that make them start to challenge their own sanity and start to accuse one another. One of the biggest themes surrounding The Haunting of Hill House is very similar to the themes explored in The Fall of the House of Usher and The Turn of the Screw. I feel like that's the third time I've mentioned this book now. And that theme is the exploration between what is an illusion and what is supernatural. How Past trauma can affect the way we see things today. So as we witness these events through the eyes of Eleanor and the other guests at Hill House, we're kind of grappling with, are these characters unreliable narrators? Are they uh, really seeing these things? Are they imagining them? It's a little bit different to The Turn of the Screw, for example, where the the protagonist is the only person who can see the ghosts and she's constantly running around and saying to saying to everyone else come on you can see him tell me you can see him and you're kind of wondering wait are they are they crazy are they losing it are they a, is this person a danger to the other people that uh, she's surrounded by um with this it's a bit different because it's not like eleanor is the only person who's hearing and seeing these things mostly hearing um everyone else can hear what's going on as well and so it becomes more a question of you know not is this one person getting a bit hysterical but is this like a mass hysteria are they all influencing what other people can hear and see i'd say of all the characters in the haunting of hill house eleanor vance is definitely the most well developed her journey is really interesting um she used to care for her late mother um and then when her mother passed away she moved in with her sister and her sister's husband and you know the 
the, her existence is very kind of stifling. They both treat her like a child. You, you can't help but feel sorry for her. She does kind of act a little bit childlike, but they, they really rub salt into the wound. They, they undermine her and they don't give her any room for growth. And so, as I say, when she's given this opportunity to go to Hill House, um, she, she, she jumps at it. Uh, she also experienced a supernatural event when she was younger, and that's the reason that Dr. Montague has, has invited her to Hill House. We hear a lot of her in a monologue, and you know, you can tell she's just a person that really wants to fit in and belong to someone, but sometimes that can get in the way that kind of desperation to want to be liked can get in the way she's always questioning whether she's giving enough of herself or maybe giving too much and she's kind of she's socially very anxious um so she's always telling herself you know oh what what you did was was stupid you 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 shouldn't have said that you shouldn't have been so open and free with your words everyone thinks you're an idiot like pull it back a little bit and then she'll start to think to herself no you're being too quiet you're being too you, you need to speak up everyone's speaking everyone's being so natural you know she's she's got a lot going on and i think a lot of people are going to be able to relate to that if you've ever been in a scenario where you think oh am i am i the weird one you know am i being a bit my being a bit quiet or a bit too loud, you know, those kind of fears are very real for, for me and, and, and for a lot of people, I think. And then you've got Theodora, who <sighs> Theo just couldn't be any more of a polar opposite to Eleanor, honestly. She's very talkative, very kind of blase. She's extremely attractive, at least Eleanor thinks she is. Um, and at first, it really seemed as though Theodora was going to be a, a good influence for Eleanor. You know, it seemed like uh, she was kind of protective of her, always trying to boost her up. And I thought, you know, oh, this this could be really good. This could be really good for Eleanor. Um, but then later, after and don't worry, I'm not going to give any spoilers. But it, 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 there were just points in the story where it felt as though her brashness and her just speaking whatever's on her mind came across as almost like bullying. I I think, you know, it's just one of those things where I felt so protective of Eleanor. And um, you know, she she can definitely be annoying though. I mean, don't get me wrong. The it, it, the, Theodore's uh reactions to Eleanor, I think, are very realistic. And then you've got Luke, who is the heir of Hill House. And uh, I've got to be honest, I found Luke to be a little bit boring. You know, honestly, I, I, I think he was written with the intention of being kind of witty and charming. But I thought his sense of humour was pretty rubbish. All of the banter that Luke and Theo share really doesn't go beyond the level of a kind of like high school sarcasm. All of their jokes are kind of like, oh, just imagine, they, they, they walk into the house and there's cobwebs everywhere and it's dark and dank and Theo will say something like, oh, what a lovely, vibrant place. <laughs> and then Luca go, oh yeah, we must come here every summer. Oh yes, and we'll have picnics and strawberries. Oh yeah, we can't forget to invite Her Majesty the Queen. Oh, she'd love it here. It's just that. That, that's that's the whole joke. That's not verbatim one of the things that they say, but it's that kind of that kind of energy that they're bringing all the time. Something scary will happen, and they'll go, "Oh, I slept very well. Oh, the noises were like a lullaby to me. Mm, me too. Mm, cup of coffee. Oh, I don't need it because I slept so well. You know, <laughs> that's it. That's it. And and it just it just kept happening. I I don't know if you've got have you got a friend who. It just will never, ever stop joking, but simultaneously are never funny, you know? It's just that they, they really want to be funny, but they're just not funny. Um, if you have one of those friends, uh, then then you might know how I feel about uh, Luke and Theo. And, and some people might like them. You might think that they're really hilarious. Uh, that's, you know, that's good. And then there's another character that kind of shows up at about the 80 or 90% mark. 
And it just felt like there was no need for this character to show up. It killed the vibe. It was like, it felt like the equivalent of having a sleepover with your friends at high school. And then the parent comes downstairs, you know, and everyone's kind of like, oh, hey, hey, how you doing? Yeah, yeah, we're just, we're just watching some movies. Yeah. And they're like, all right, boys, all right, what's, what's going on? Can you keep it down? I've got work in the morning. And you're just like, yeah, yeah, we'll keep it down. You know, the group, the group had already kind of come together. What, who's, this, who's this new person? Uh, I didn't like that. It, it, it really, it felt like it, it, it broke the tension, kind of. And I know that a lot of people are going to disagree with me. And actually, that's cool because, you know, that's the idea of these sorts of channels, right? Is that we can all talk about the book and everything. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I know lots of people that are watching this video are, are going to disagree with me. But I found the first half of the book that was exploring the characters, especially Eleanor, to be far more interesting than the second half of the book when all the spooky stuff started to happen. I, I I didn't find anything in this book to be scary. I hate to disagree with Stephen King and Neil Gaiman, you know, who am I? Some mug. I didn't find it, I didn't find this book to be scary. I didn't find any of the, the ghosts to be scary in any way. Um, and actually after that, uh, after about the halfway point, things just got a little bit less interesting. As the narrative progresses, uh, Eleanor's mental state starts to deteriorate as reality and the supernatural kind of blur and you're not sure what's real, what's not. Also, I don't know if it was just me and I feel so vulnerable when I say stuff like this on this channel because it kind of opens me up to everyone in the comment section going, you idiot, <laughs> you know, but it, it was obvious. But uh, I didn't really understand exactly what the intention of the house was. I didn't know what was the intention. I, I, and also I didn't really understand exactly what their what the powers of the house was like what could it do what were its limitations if any you know if it had any powers if anything was happening you know it was kind of uh yeah i just so yeah basically i i thought that the story started really well i actually thought the end was good i thought the the ending of the book was good uh, i felt like it dragged in the middle and undoubtedly, listen, th this book is a, a cornerstone in classic horror and it has a very special place in a lot of people's hearts, especially horror writers who, who are heavily influenced by this. And so I'm grateful that this book exists. I just, yeah, I just didn't find it to be very scary. And oh, actually, there, there, was, there was one scene that was quite scary. There was one. There was one. Uh, I, I, if you haven't read it, don't worry. I, I, I'll just give a clue to the people that have read it. It involves hand-holding. I've read, as I said, 10 classic horrors this month. Dracula, Frankenstein, The Call of Cthulhu, The Fall of the House of Usher, The Monkey's Paw. And I think I'm done with ambiguity for a while. I've sort of like reached max level of ambiguity. I'm looking forward to reading some books in November where I know that something is or is not happening, you know? Like I don't need to figure out whether something's happening or not. I just I just know for certain. Ah oh, man, that's gonna feel nice. And I feel like that's another thing that I have to take into account when talking about uh, the, this book is that maybe I just picked it up at the wrong time. This is number 10 of 10. And so if I had started with this book and this was the first classic horror that I read, would I have enjoyed it a lot more? Or is, you know, is it the fact that I've read so many books now that have a similar kind of sense of eeriness and uncertainty that I'm kind of like, oh man, like this, this, let's mix it up a little bit. And that's not, that's not the fault of this book, you know? Yeah, that could be it. That definitely could be it. But with that being said, I've actually got one more video uh, regarding classic horror coming up. 
And that is where I'm going to rank the book. So I'm going to have a little bit of fun with it. Uh, I'm going to kind of do it as, I think, a knockout tournament. <laughs> Oh man, I just can't do things simply. But if you'd like to see that video where we're gonna crown the king or the queen of classic horror and decide what is the best classic horror, uh, then you can click up here to watch that video. Thanks so much for watching the video and as always, happy reading.